Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Cancer Support Community's What's in Your First Aid Kit series. My name is Elizabeth Franklin, and I'm president of the Cancer Support Community. We are a global nonprofit network of 175 locations, including Cancer Support Community and Gilda's Club affiliates, hospital and clinic partnerships, and overall, we deliver $50 million in free support and navigation services to patients and families. We also administer a toll-free helpline and produce award-winning educational and digital resources that reach more than 1 million people every year. And we conduct cutting-edge cutting edge research on the emotional, psychological, and financial journeys of cancer patients. And with all of that, we then advocate at all levels of government for policies to help individuals whose life have been disrupted by cancer. Our belief that community is stronger than cancer is what led us to create this seven session program for oncology professionals. We recognize that you, the cancer care community, are on the front lines of care. The care you provide impacts cancer patients, survivors, and caregivers from the moment of diagnosis and through the end of life. And we thank you so much for your commitment, your passion, and for your compassionate expertise. And now it is truly my pleasure to introduce one of my favorite people, our presenter, Krista Nelson. Krista is trained as an oncology social worker and works in clinical and research roles with the Providence Cancer Institute. She's a program manager in the Department of Compassion, which I love that. I love that name of the department. This blend has allowed Krista to bring her clinical expertise to work with those impacted by cancer and to create supportive infusions of compassion to caregivers within Providence Health and Services. Krista is also president of the Association of Community Cancer Centers. Krista provides individual and group support for those affected with cancer and additionally has an expertise in facilitating online support groups, more important than ever. She also coordinates a program that focuses on the care of children who have a parent with cancer. Krista's uh, very impressive past includes being past president of the board of directors of the Association of Oncology Social Work and past director of the American Psychosocial Oncology Society, National Accreditation Program for Breast Centers, and American Clinical Social Work Association. Krista was named as a finalist in the Schwartz Center Compassionate Caregiver of the Year Award and was awarded the American Cancer Society and Association of Oncology Social Work Leadership Award in 2019 and Social Worker of the Year for Providence Health and Services in Oregon in 2021. Krista has also been a volunteer facilitator at retreats for women with breast cancer and annually at camps and programs that support grieving children. She has volunteered over five months on medical relief teams to Haiti since 2009 and locally with Portland Street Medicine, providing mental health support to the houseless in Portland, Oregon. In her free time, she enjoys hiking, biking, photography, and cheering on her local soccer team, the Timbers. And I know also spending time with her new kitten. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Krista. And Krista, thank you so much for joining us. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here with you. I want to check quick. Are you guys able to see my slide? Yes, we can. Oh, perfect. So uh, I would really like to start uh, thanking you, uh, Cancer Support Community, Elizabeth, Sarah, Carrot, just for all of the support and really hearing all that Cancer Support Community does for the cancer community is pretty overwhelming. And uh, we're really grateful, grateful for that as the community. I'm going to try to magically advance my slide. Perfect. Uh, I do have a disclosure. I, uh, I do a patient advisory board with Athenic, Athenix Oncology, but also I think what I'm hopeful for today is that we can just really spend some time um, and I'm going to be sharing a perspective. It may not be uh, the perspective that resonates with you, but my guess is I will be asking some questions and asking you to stop and pause and really reflect. So I'm hopeful that our time today is really just um, a time to really connect with maybe where our values are. I think one of the things we maybe don't do as well should is reflect. We're so busy taking care of everyone else as caregivers. It's so important to just pause 
and maybe pivot. Maybe what was important to us before, where our values, have, are we still in line with those? So today I'm going to talk a little bit, we're going to reflect, I'm going to start in really the reflection today is to consider where we've been in this past year. Um, I picked some images. I'm on the West Coast that really resonate with me with things that happened in our world, things that happened in our community, and just take a time to just remember. I don't know, we're so busy in our day-to-day -day just surviving now. What I'm hopeful for is that we can pause and just remember kind of where we've been. Um, and, and a big part of that is COVID. I also am gonna talk a little bit about burnout, resilience and suffering um, because we can't really talk about self-care without kind of touching on those. Um, and then talk more about aligning with our values um, and perhaps finding meaning in the work and um, finding our true north. So I'm hopeful that today is a little more of a reflective session and hoping um, that, that we are and COVID has changed everything. Um, I think perhaps as oncology people, professionals, we've learned that maybe we're more connected to our patients in ways that we ever have been or thought we were. Um, it, it's almost as though we're all living on the same uncertain playing field. Um, I think COVID has changed what our perspectives and what we think or know to be important to us now, maybe previously that we weren't aware of. Um, if I think one of the images I like to kind of reframe or redirect COVID is considering, could we think as of our compassion and love is to be as contagious as COVID is? So I wanted to start today talking about values. You know, what are important to us, um, characteristics that motivate us, perhaps some people value security, other people value adventure. Everyone is different, but I also think there's this implicit bias that we, we feel like we should be one way or say one thing. And so I'm gonna challenge you today as you look at perhaps all these different values, or as you reflect on your own, thinking about truly honoring who you are and not what we think others think we should do. So when I think about personal values, I like to think of what is your why? What is important to you and how do you prioritize what you do, where you work, who you spend time with? You know, for some people, it may be something like family, freedom, authenticity, justice, love. There's so many different things it can be. But I think our personal values also are part of our makeup. So we may have some cultural issues that um, buy into who we are, what's important to us, spirituality and faith, family, life experience, our professional identity the education and, and what we value with that. So really thinking about your personal values, what drives you and what sort of got you to this place to be motivated um, to be doing the work that you do and asking yourself, does this work align with where I am today? I'm lucky enough to, so I'm a social worker by training and, and lucky to work with an organ, you know, to be represented um, by um, a profession that has core values. So when I think about my core values and if they align with my profession, personally for me, my joke is I was a social worker and then I happened to start doing social work as a profession. So that sense of service, uh, social justice, holding on to the dignity of worth of, of the person. I so value human relationships, integrity, competence. And then I think about where I work. I work for a nonprofit, large cancer um, center that's part of a huge network of a, a you know, health system. And we have core values. So I think, you know, thinking about is where you work have core values. The core values of my workplace that I identify with and they're everywhere is compassion, um, social justice, 
justice, uh, care for the poor and vulnerable. And I think it's pretty, as you heard in my introduction, I actually get to work in a department of compassion. So for me, finding a place to work that really does hold the value and the integrity of, of what my personal values are has likely helped sustain me in being there for 24 years. So there are lots of different models of finding meaning and a, a lot of different therapies, many theoretical perspectives. Um, values are very important in many psychotherapies. Acceptance and commitment therapy is, is one. And uh, you know that sense of when a person doesn't live in accordance with their values, they tend to feel unsatisfied. Um, there's meaning centered therapy, existential therapy, psychotherapy, so many different therapies. But when I think about what's meaningful to me, um, this, I liked this model because it had uh, some different domains that I thought a lot of my values personally could fit into. And I'm wondering um, for you as well. So relationships, uh, learning and personal growth, adventure and risk taking, or maybe the opposite, safety, community connections, work, status and power, fun and play, spirituality, religion, service, integrity and honesty, freedom and independence, and innovation and creativity. So I'm just going to pause, take a look at those, and I want you to start to think what in your life or where you're at do any of those resonate with maybe what is most meaningful to you right now? It doesn't, I'm not asking sort of um, for you to share, and we're going to ask you to share anonymously. Now, it doesn't, uh, we're not going to say who said what, um, but I really would ask you to look inside and consider what is it that is resonating with you right now? You know, what are you good at? What do you love to do? maybe what the world needs right now, because by picking your values or, or identifying what they are, I want to say with a caveat, they are something you can work towards to having more in your life. But I think again, COVID has been this opportunity to really pause and maybe take a chance to re-identify and, and re, you know, really redesign where you are right now and what's important. So I'm going to ask if, if you can put some of your values in the chat and I'll share mine after too. And then I'm hopeful that Sarah can share if there are any values that pop up in the chat. Yep. So integrity has come forward, uh, learning and personal growth, freedom, freedom, community, community, family, family, honesty, so as we listen to that list, um, thank you so much for those of you that shared, you know, I'm thinking as you, you're, even as you're listening to this, if you're thinking about some values that, that are important to you, maybe pausing to reflect, have those changed recently? And do they still ring true to you? Um, there are several models of, and several worksheets on sort of aligning with your values. And I like this one because it had all the different domains and I chose just a few. And really how you use these value sheets is you identify importance. So of each of those on a ranking of say one to 10 and multiple can have the same ranking. 10 is the most important in this, in this model. Um, and then you kind of do a self-assessment. How successful are you at it now? And then taking the pause and really identifying how are those ranking for you? Then the value direction is just some sentences, a short sentence to write what your goal is and maybe things you can do to attain that over time. And really just pausing and thinking to yourself, is what I'm doing day to day in alignment with my values. And the reason we're getting to this is going to come next because we know people who are more aligned with their values, um, feel, have a better quality of life, professionals, 
um, they do experience less burnout and they have more meaning in their life. So I'm going to share a few with you, only the ones that I was doing well, because I wanted us to, uh, you know, the positive start out well. So for me, um, you know, family, family relationships are very important. I want to be a loving and supportive daughter and I'm going to work on communicating. You know, it's been very hard. My parents don't live here uh, where I am and plan to visit them more often. The importance to me, absolutely the most important 10. Why I gave myself an eight? Well, I surprised my parents in the last uh, two months twice and because of vaccines, been able to fly to visit them. So um, community and connections also very important to me, maybe a seven out of 10. I don't really know why I came up with that number. It's just what came to me. Um, but I want to be a resource to my neighbors, my community. And, you know, I think COVID has for me changed my relationship with my immediate community and my family members. And I bet if we were in the same room, I would see a lot of heads nodding as well. So for me, I've been volunteering uh, weekly with the houseless, um, trying to improve the quality of care for my community um, and pr provide some compassion for my community as well. So when we think about your personal values, I would just encourage you to really know what they are. I mean, if I, you know, at the beginning of this, if I asked you what your values are, if, if you were like me, even before I did this prepared for this talk and really did some self-reflection, I may pause and not really be able to come to it. I'd want to see a list of values first and say, oh yeah, these things resonate with me. But then considering how you prioritize them and how you use your values to make your decision, it's really pausing and, and using some intent in your time. I think uh, one of the things we found with COVID in my colleagues, my own personal life, is that it has slowed things down a little bit. And um, I'm sorry for those of you that, that have had so much going on that you don't feel that slowness. I'm aware that many of you are raising children and doing your full-time job and teaching school and, and all of those things. And I do know that there is less, there has been less social, social time. And with that, you know, can we be intentional? Can we take a mindful pause and really sit and think, where do, where do things resonate with me? And after COVID, or not after, but as we emerge, hopefully, out of this pandemic, what, what do we want to take what we've learned from the pandemic? And where do we want to go moving forward? And just really trying to make decisions um, in alignment when you can with what resonates with you and to also adapt. I think, again, the thing that COVID has allowed for a lot of us is really pause and adapt. Think about how we do things. So when I talk about value making, can think about what distracts us from our true north. So what is keeping us from doing this? Time, maybe lack of our own clarity, burnout, um, I know we have many, many sessions on this toolkit of people talking about resilience, the impact of burnout, worrying about other people's perceptions of what we value. And I think if our values are in conflict with white, wider society, that is really hard. And I think lastly, I'm sure there are many other things that distract us from being in alignment with our true values, but I think grief really has something that's resonated with me over this last year um, with COVID. I spoke with a, a friend of mine um, and she was working in the COVID unit on Mother's Day. She is a young mother and um, she'd appreciate that I said she's a young mother. Um, she's a mother of young children. And she um, was sharing with me that she was brought to her knees this week on Mother's Day. And she's been caring for patients with COVID throughout the entire uh, pandemic. But now I think one of the things that's come up for her is the sense of feeling hopeful and feeling like we are coming out of the other side. The numbers in our hospital are starting to trend down. And she shared with me on Mother's Day that she was caring for a woman in her seventies who had a daughter um, who was had active COVID infection in the hospital and things were not trending in, 
a way that was going to probably prolong her life or that she would live. And uh, my colleague shared that she was in contact with the daughter the entire week. And the daughter was very much against getting vaccines, had encouraged her mom to not get a vaccine, wanting to use a more natural way to um, uh, fight COVID and, and stay healthy. And my friend is in this situation of having to talk to this family member and saying, you know, at our hospital, you're not allowed to have a visitor if you have COVID unless you go on to comfort care and stop aggressive measures for life. So she's in this position daily talking to families of that fine line of saying, I'm afraid if you, if we don't transition to comfort care soon, that your mom will die and you will not be able to say goodbye to her. And for this daughter, just in disbelief that this was happening. And what my friend shared is she internally was holding so much anger and rage around people's decisions around whether they get vaccines or not. And how that's impacted her personally is that then she feels she's taking care of people with COVID and therefore then potentially bringing it home to her girls. Um, and the fear of that, the fear of that through this whole pandemic, but now just a new sense, a, a different perspective. And as we talk through it, she still, you know, she's still in a place where her values or where she's finding meaning in her life right now is with the care uh, of these families, but also allowing herself to grieve that this has been hard, that there is so much, um, just, you know, our community is torn apart for so many ways right now and just acknowledging that grief, but then coming back to the things that bring her joy and finding meaning. So when we think about the effect of COVID on healthcare workers, I pulled just a few studies uh, recently that have done specifically on COVID um, on healthcare workers and some were, you know, physicians specific, some were nurses and physicians, but you can see the rates of depression, chronic anxiety, um, and PTSD, um, that have been reported during COVID. And I think as we think about the mental health of our teams, also looking at this study that came out just, uh, last summer, of um, physicians and then nurses and their rate of self-report of problem drinking, depression, anxiety, and PTSD. Those numbers are very high. And I think an awareness that we have to do something um, to support our community and ourselves after we've been living through COVID. So when I think about burnout, um, I know we've had many discussions on burnout and resilience. And I think number one, um, I want to be the first to say that this is not uh, something you've done wrong. If you're feeling burnout, I think, well, I would bet money that all of us have felt burnout at some point in the last year. Um, I like to think of that energy as something that can come and go. Um, but you know, finding meaning in your work has been proven to be a prote protective factor against burnout. Also, um, there's just finding meaning and that effect that it has on your life satisfaction is important. Um, and improving the meaning of work can have a protective effect against stress, thereby improving the quality of care that's provided by professionals, especially in palliative care. And healthcare professionals with the most stress tend to assign less meaning in their work. So, you know, you can see it's correlated in some ways. That doesn't mean if you're feeling burnout that you don't find meaning, but it is important, I think, to have a touch point or maybe even pause and identify what does give you meaning. So in that moment, this is a quote from Krista Tippett, how do we keep walking forward? and even find renewal along the way in this year of things blown apart. What sustains you? 
How do you hold on to the sense of what is whole and true and undamaged, even in the face of loss? So I wanted to share a story of my friend and colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Bernstein. He's in Portland, Oregon. He said I could share his information. So he was busy, like all of us, taking care. He's a medical oncologist in Hood River, rural community um, in Port outside of Portland, um, taking care of uh, a general oncologist, all patients with cancer, and uh, was in the middle of a workout routine and is 49 and had a massive stroke. Uh, brain bleed, uh, was alone, managed to dial 911. The weather was bad, couldn't get life flighted and had to be uh, driven for a massive brain surgery and, and bleed. And um, I was able to spend some time with him uh, two weekends ago in his beautiful house that was scheduled to just be finished around when he had the time of his stroke and connect with him. And he is now, he recovered, had a, a, a long nine hour brain surgery and is now um, still recovering, still struggling with his speech, um, working on movement completely intact as well as his humor is completely intact. Um, but really sort of, it, it made me, as I was preparing to do this talk, think about his identity and what I knew to be his identity and what we shared was this meaning in the work that we do. And then suddenly the work is gone. You know, he's not able to work right now. So then we stop and think, you know, what else gives you meaning? You know, if you suddenly were unable to work anymore, you know, where do you find your meaning? And he very quickly said in this, in relationships and spending time with friends, communicating. Um, he is a guy of gadgets and has always made the best lattes with these like perfect hearts. And when I first got there, he said he wanted to make you a latte. And I was sort of surprised he's still using a walker and a little unsteady. And I said, go for it. Let's, let's have a latte. And um, I put a picture in the middle. He's like, oh, my heart still suck. But it is just so amazing to see how much progress he's made and so grateful that even if the heart isn't perfect, that he's here. So I just wanted to share, you know, even if we lose maybe what we thought we most identified with, there is still a way to find meaning. And he believes that connecting to those things that are most meaningful is what's helped him uh, sustain his, his attitude and his joy that he's still finding every day. So Viktor Frankl, I know you're all very familiar with him and a psychologist in the concentration camps, uh, even in Auschwitz. And, and this is one of his most uh, famous quotes, um, between the stimulus and the response, there is a space. In that space is our power to choose our response. And in our response lies our growth and freedom. So as we think about that, I'm going to transition to talking about maybe how, how we find meaning um, in life and for ourselves. Uh, Viktor Frankl really believed that we can discover meaning three ways, um, but he really shared that the paradoxical secret to finding meaning might be to not look for it, but rather the most satisfying forms of meaning may blossom when we pursue it directly, when we seek beauty, love, justice or a cause greater than our own. So, you know, is it through love and relationships? Is it by experiencing something or encountering someone? These are sort of basic of his logotherapy ideals work. Is it by creating a work or doing a deed and by suffering? And so by the attitude we take towards unavoidable suffering, and that everything can be taken from man, but one thing, to choose one's attitude at any given moment. So, you know, for this talk and at this time, I really resonated with finding meaning in suffering. And as I share, there's many uh, therapeutic um, contexts that we use as clinical social workers, psychologists, therapists, um, psychiatrists to find meaning and we're working with our patients. But I like this post-traumatic growth model when I think about suffering specifically, thinking if you, if you experience something positive 
from something that's hard. So, you know, what are the silver linings of what you've gone through? Maybe you're identifying, oh my gosh, look at what I've accomplished when I've gone through something hard and maybe just pausing in this moment. And for you all look at what you've been through in this past year and that you are here and that you are surviving. It may not look what you thought it would, and you're doing a great job. Relationships, um, maybe people connect with people who've had similar difficulties. Um, suffering does tend to bring people together. In my own life, when I've experienced great grief, I do often in those moments feel better to be around others that are grieving or experiencing that same loss. Um, personally, maybe we have a greater life appreciation. So tragedy can really shift our perspective um, and we can really use the use of gratitude. Um, so maybe through COVID, one thing that has been a uh, silver lining is telehealth. So as hard as that can be at some times, it is a way that we've been able to stay connected to our patients. Maybe using FaceTime is a way we've been able to stay connected to our families. Um, and I think when we think about our beliefs and how those change after a big event is just knowing that our personal beliefs may be changed, but they can also be reinforced. What was meaningful to you before, maybe that is still meaningful now. And then with any change, I think looking for new possibilities. So going back to my friend, uh, Dr. Bernstein, you know, what are other ways he can provide meaningful support to the oncology community? So there's a lot of work been done um, at Mor Memorial with uh, Dr. Breitbart and his team on finding meaning in cancer. Um, and I think understanding the significance of the illness and how that resonates with our mind, body, and spirit, really looking at life review, how uh, our change in ourself and our change in relationships through cancer and a reevaluation of our own values. So I think as healthcare professionals, we have a lot to learn from our patients. Um, healthcare professionals who work in palliative care units face stressful life events on a daily basis, but most notably death. And for this reason, the professionals must be equipped with the necessary protective resources to help them cope with professional and personal burnout. Um, and I think when we, we look at his research and that team's research, that healthcare professionals with the most stress tend to assign less meaning to their work. But nevertheless, many professionals experience their work with a high degree of commitment and meaning despite the high levels of stress. Um, and in this regard, professionals that they did study tend to see professional activity not as a burden, but as a challenge, as well as a path for self-realization and personal growth. Um, I think, interestingly, when we look at the palliative care professionals that have been studied, they tend to feel more alive, empathetic, sensitive, and spiritual oriented because of their repeated exposure to death. And even those experiences can provide certain insight into the nature of death and may benefit others that they work with. So when we think about our work and how we help others find meaning, are there lessons that we can, we can learn for ourselves as well? So key everyday lessons, I think really identifying in this moment is there something you can create in the world? Is it work? Is it art? Can you develop and maintain relationships? What really is the most important to you? Can we find purpose in suffering? Can we agree that life isn't fair? Freedom to find meaning? Focus on others? Can we be quiet and use a mindful pause? Writing in nature. So these are all things that we can do to help make sure that we are aligning with our values and finding meaning in the work that we do. 
So as we pause and we think about the after COVID experience, I'm wondering if you can take a moment to reflect on your life, on your work right now in this moment, and perhaps share in the chat, what is sacred for you right now in this moment? And I'll ask Susan to share if anyone shared. Family. Uh, family and connection, friends, pets, protected time with loved ones. So many of those are relationships. Right. Yeah, and I think as we think about that, and even, you know, for my friend, Dr. Bernstein, how he shows up for people, and what we learn from cancer is that we can't always do for people how we have done. Maybe you can't still do the job that you've done. Maybe if you're at home taking care of your kids and working, you can't do the work in the same way. But what you can do is have control over how you are or how you can be with people and relationships and know that that's enough in that moment to just be. So my, my encouragement today is hoping that you had an opportunity to do a little reflection on your personal values, pausing, are you aware of decisions that you make on a day-to-day -day basis and how those align to your values? And then knowing full well that your values help establish you finding meaning. If you're, if you're aligned with your values, we know you'll have a better quality of life. So I wanted to share with you uh, this blessing for work by John O'Donohue. And maybe if it's comfortable for you, wherever you are, to maybe look downward or cast your eyes down, close your eyes. May the light of your soul bless your work with love and warmth of the heart. May you see in what you do the beauty of your soul. May the sacredness of your work bring light and renewal to those who work with you and to those who see and receive your work. May your work never exhaust you. Rather, may it release wellsprings of refreshment, inspiration, and excitement. May your work be infused with a loving heart. May you know that your work is an offering of ministry. May you truly know that you are a revelation of God's love especially as you serve those in need. May you be filled with the knowledge that this is sacred work. You are called to be here now at this time and this place. Peace to you. So as, as you reflect on all the things that we've talked about today, maybe pausing to acknowledge and accepting some gratitude from me on behalf of your patients and the people that you work with. Um, that I know that day to day, you sacrifice time away from your family, your loved ones, um, people you're connected to, your own relationships to serve others. And we're so grateful for you for doing that. Um, this is a picture of uh, one of my friends. I bike past this house. It's one of my colleagues. It's an oncologist's daughter. Um, and at the beginning of the pandemic, she would wave to us as we went uh, off to work. Um, 
and just wanted to share that message with you all that you be well. So I'm going to pause there and see if anyone has any questions or comments in the chat. Yes. So Krista, um, many of the folks that got on today are social workers um, in a variety of settings. And um, not only are folks taking care of patients, but also, you know, uh, acknowledging the suffering of their colleagues. What are some ways in which um, professional social workers can um, lead from this value proposition um, to perhaps bring some depth and comfort to their colleagues? Yes, thank you so much for that question. Um, a big part of my day-to-day -day role, I feel like, is providing support to my colleagues um, you know, who aren't necessarily social workers, so the medical team that I work with. I think the number one thing that we can do as clinicians is use our reflective listening skills and our, our therapeutic uh, skills as far as listening and really hearing what people are saying. I think in those moments, the truth is to be your authentic self. So a relationship with a colleague is likely different than that of working with a patient or a family member and meeting them with your authentic heart and really listening. I think the one of the things I've seen is in the losses is the isolation. We used to have so many opportunities to debrief in a day, and now we just run back to wherever we can be a corner we can find where we can take a breath without our mask and our shield and um, to grab a drink of water. And we miss that sort of so-called water cooler discussion um, times connecting. It's just been a time of big isolation. I think one of the things as social workers that a social worker that I have done is on all meetings, I'm kind of a stinker about it, but I always ask everyone to turn their camera on and people hate it, <laughs> but I love to see their kids or, you know, the physicians just even seeing the eyes and connecting. I think the other thing I, um, you do, if I'm connecting with people face to face is hearing their stories, hearing what's concerning them, validating it, normalizing it, and then really normalizing the need for support right now. I would say I at least twice a day am recommending um, counseling or support to the people that I work with and helping them get connected in the community with therapists. Um, it's really a lot right now and it may be something that people don't know how to access or do and as clinical social workers, that's our job. Um, but I think the truth, what we really can do is be present. Long answer, sorry. That's okay. You know, we're seeing a question that came through and I'll kind of lead with it is, um, you know, we're seeing all throughout the news that people are leaving their jobs mm -hmm. and that because of last year, people are really re-looking at what they value and perhaps how they were not living uh, a life aligned with their values. Mm -hmm. And um, can you speak a little bit? Um, the question is about how do you know um, that your value uh, values are aligned? Um, because often we are so engaged with the busyness of work and the busyness of life uh, that um, we conflate um, busy and work with our values, but our values yeah. might not be work. Well, I think that is so well said. And, and the truth is it's actually going to involve taking a pause and doing some work and whether you feel able to do that on your own, there's a zillion uh, worksheets online for free that are finding value worksheets or um, example of the one that I showed. But the truth is actually taking the time. There's so much noise right now. We, um, many people, honestly, even myself, find myself distracting myself in moments where I could just be in quiet, but I'm turning on a podcast. I'm listening to an audio book. I'm, you know, FaceTime and looking at my phone. And it's interesting. I would really recommend 
the next time, you know, it's the, you know, whatever day you're listening to this, it happens to be a weekend or an evening, you know, can you just give yourself 30 minutes to really pause and do a little worksheet on a scrap of paper? You don't have to do worksheet, just actually feeling, looking at a list of different values in those different categories and really thinking, okay, what do I value? And I, I don't want um, anyone listening to this to feel any shame if you didn't know how to answer that when it first came up, because we are so busy and we're just trying to breathe. And But I think as we come out of COVID, hopefully, and come out of this crisis, we know clinically that that's a time when we maybe have more of a chance to have bigger emotions. And so, you know, we've been sort of in survival mode and I, I wouldn't doubt that as we emerge from this time that we really may have some personal crises about what do I want to do? Or, oh gosh, we were able to live on one income or do I really need a car or spending time or I miss travel so much. I missed adventure and I want to prioritize more of that. You are worth taking the time to really stop and figure that out. We get on this machine of doing everything for everyone, especially as caregivers. And I just please encourage you to just pause and consider just jotting down and then thinking about it. Maybe you send yourself an email in a week or you look at your meetings for the week and say, okay, how can my values fit into these meetings? Or I volunteered for this project. Does this align with something that's meaningful to me? Or am I just doing this because people, I should do this because I'm a social worker or an oncologist, you know, whatever it is. So my encouragement would be to actually just take some time and pause. And if you know, you're not going to do it, you know, you like to just be busy and listening, then schedule an appointment with a therapist who can help you make that time. You know, many of us have to schedule things in our lives. It's just like exercise. There's not going to just suddenly open and two hours in our day to go on a hike. We have to plan those things. Krista, thank you so much for being with us today. I really appreciate you taking the time and, um, not only allowing us to, to hold our, our grief, um, but taking the, the time and encouraging us to find joy and meaning um, in all the experiences we've had this year and for those to come. And thank you uh, again for all of our attendees. Uh, we so much appreciate you being here and taking the time um, out of your busy schedules to pause and reflect with us. And um, Definitely want to thank our sponsors, Merck and Takeda. Without them, we would not be able to have these programs for you. So thank you again to them. Uh, we have a couple more sessions coming up. So uh, we have one, I believe, in a couple Saturdays in the beginning of June. So please feel free to sign up for that session and our last two sessions in this series. And last but not least, you will find um, a survey link after we end this program. So please, we love your feedback and definitely want to know programs that you're interested in in the future. So it's just take a couple minutes and fill out that evaluation. If you do have questions um, and we haven't been able to answer them today, please feel free to reach out to myself or to Susan and we'd be glad to answer those questions for you. This session is being recorded and will be posted on the CSC website. So stay tuned for that as well. And Krista, again, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, everyone. Take care.